her best friend. That's what she tells me. Evelyn and Grace. I know, if, if, if it's that hard, you don't remember. 
Good morning. Good morning. Now you're awake. I'm so glad you're here with us this morning for Discipleship Conference, some regular faces, some new faces. I'm super excited to see you as we learn more about how to outreach to our community through discipleship and disciple making. Would you stand with us this morning? We're going to sing Come Thou Almighty King. Praise team introduced this song last week. I'd like you to join us this morning as we lift our voices in worship to the Lord. Thank you. 
adventure uh, back to the gym, otherwise known as the Kappa Gymatorium. Uh, we are, we're not always back here, um, but it's it's interesting as we have some different things through the year to, to move back here, and uh, hopefully you remember that, that this is church, just because we're not in the room with the cross and the baptistry, because it's not the building that makes the church, right? Uh, we are the church. Hey, can I have that for a second? I want to go back to uh, something we sang. Sorry, the, the remote. You know the guy. He has to have the remote. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, anybody think this was kind of weird when we sang this verse of this song? Because this kind of fits with what some people think about prayer and about Jesus. Right? If I'll just pray, Jesus will fix all my problems. And that's what it says, isn't it? If I but ask him, if I, if I just pray and ask, he will deliver, he will make of my troubles quickly and end. He will make them stop. And I've talked to a lot of young people and a lot of adults who are angry at God because they prayed about something and he didn't do it, and so they have no use for God in their life. But that's not what the hymn writer was saying. You see, if you look up the definition of the word in, like many words in our English language, it has multiple contexts, multiple meanings. It can mean something stops, or it can mean, have you ever had somebody ask you, hey, what's your end goal? What are they asking? Are, you, are they asking what timeline do you want the thing to stop? No, they're asking about what is your purpose. And when the writer used the word end in this situation, he was saying, God isn't necessarily going to make it stop, but he's going to make it purposeful. 
And in fact, in Romans chapter 8, we know exactly what purpose that is. It says that every one of us who trusts Jesus as Savior, God has predestined. He's already laid out a path that those who become Christians will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Everything that happens in your life, God will use it for a purpose. I didn't say God would cause it, but he will use it. So as we sing these hymns, let's think about those things because not only is that encouraging to sing, but boy, it really makes us stop and think about and get a little deeper about our prayer life and about what God's doing in our life. So hopefully that, that hymn will be an encouragement to you, uh, but also we want to make sure we're not trying to teach people that if they'll just pray about things, God will give them whatever they want, right? So it's good to see you this morning. Right now, we're going to go ahead and dismiss the children to children service. So if you have a young person who is uh, three and potty trained up through five or up through kindergarten, do I have those, those ages right? Three through kindergarten, yeah. It's usually on the screen. I don't have to remember. Um, three through kindergarten. If you would like for them to go to the children's service, they don't have to. Uh, you're the parent. You get to decide. But if you would like for them to go, the workers are going to be back here at the door. They'll meet them, take them to class, have their teaching time, and then they'll stay there. You can go pick them up after class, after service is over. If you need help finding that room, we'll be happy to help you with that. And there is uh, infant nursery. Um, if you would like to take advantage of that, that is uh, going on this morning. Is that back in the, the regular Sunday morning nursery? Okay, so that's on the opposite end of campus. <laughs> But we can help you find it. It's no problem. It's not that far away. Um, but good morning. Thank you for being with us. This morning is the, uh, the wrap-up, really, of our disciple-making conference. Uh, we see so clearly in Scripture that when Jesus spent his ministry and spent his life, it wasn't just waiting until he could die on the cross. If it was, he could have died on the cross at 16 or 12. Or before his three years of public ministry. But he didn't. He lived to be 30 and then he went out and he served the community. He did some things for three and a half years. We have those recorded for us in scripture. And then he died on the cross to be able to offer us salvation. And, and we rejoice in that. But we can't miss what he did for the three and a half years before that. He showed us what it looks like to live the Christian life. Because you and I don't get saved and immediately go to heaven. Right? So we, we come to the cross, but then what do we do? We go and we follow the example of Jesus. And what did Jesus do for three and a half years? He made disciples. And at the end of that time, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he stood in front of those disciples after the cross and after the uh, resurrection. And he said, now here's what you do. I'm leaving. You go make disciples of all nations. And so we understand our job today is to go make disciples of all nations. And so as we spent this weekend looking at Friday night, those who are already discipling and if, who have been through the training, a refresher for what's God called us to do and what does that look like and how do we accomplish that? And yesterday morning, spending time looking at not only a, a refresher on discipleship and disciple making, but how do we see the process, not just be us here in the room, us, us Christians helping each other grow, that we're supposed to do that, that's part of it. But if it never goes outside the walls of this church building, is it going to reach the world? No. And that was the plan, was to reach the world. And so we need to help each other grow. We need to have a plan to help us become mature Christ followers. But part of that process is making sure that we go outside the walls of the church and we take the gospel to people who don't already know Jesus. And so we're focusing this year not on just the in-house, so to speak, the discipleship, but how does that process look when we start making sure we go to the unsaved, the unchurched, the lost, anybody that doesn't know Jesus already, and help them to come to know Jesus, and then help them grow as a Christian? So we've invited Tom Maxwell. Tom Maxwell is a good friend of mine. Uh, we met, uh, I had forgotten, we met, gosh, that was 25, 6, 7, a bunch of years ago. Um, I was doing an internship during college at my home church, and the last Sunday that I was there that summer before I went back to school was the first Sunday that Tom came uh, to check out working at the church with youth ministry. And so we overlapped by one youth meeting, and then uh, he became a youth pastor there and was there many years later. Um, that's where I served before I came here to gospel. I served on staff at my home church, and so Tom and I well, Tom had the privilege of working with me for six years. Uh, it was a wonderful time for him, uh, best years of his life. He still talks about it. 
with his therapist. And so um, <laughs> I, I asked him to come because I, I shared this earlier, I think. Tom and I are about as opposite as you can get. I grew up in church and then heard about discipleship after college. He didn't even hear about church till after he was a Christian and being a disciple. And, and he's the person that he would love nothing than to sit down and talk with a, a group of people while I would like nothing more than to sit out in the woods by myself. And, and just about everything about us is opposite, but God brought us together because we're both passionate about disciple making and about discipleship. And so it was really cool to be able to work with him. And I thought, you know what? You guys hear this from me. You hear this from Pastor Rich all the time. Uh, we brought in Brother Rob Reno last year, and you heard disciple making, discipleship stuff from him. So let's bring in somebody else, a different voice. And so after service is over today, I know he'd love to answer your questions and talk with you if you have questions about it. But right now, I'm going to ask uh, Tom Maxwell to come and share with us about how to do this disciple making. Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, we want to begin to look at what did Jesus do when it came to reaching outside and reaching out to the lost? And so he wanted to change the world that was around him. And we're going to look at how do we do that through a process that we lovingly call eternal CPR. Now, everybody knows what CPR is, right? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's where you save a life. Well, eternal CPR is, is similar, and we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes of what that looks like, but eternal CPR is how you save a life for eternity. And so we're going to begin to unpack that. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to camp out in John chapter 4, and if you're familiar with that, that's the story about the woman at the well in Samaria. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Let me take a minute and introduce to you my family. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Debbie. We've been married for 35 and a half years. Love being married to that woman. She is my best friend and my cohort in crime. Uh, I drag her into a lot of stuff, and she'll tell you that. Uh, she also uh, loves to make disciples, and she has invested in a tremendous amount of young women in our church and in our community, and uh, I just love doing uh, life with her. We're empty nesters. So I explained yesterday that we are having the time of our life. All our kids are gone uh, and out of the house. We love our kids. We love them to death. We love it when they come to visit, but we also love it when they go home. So uh, we enjoy being empty nesters. We, we, we are best friends. We love, love hanging out together. In fact, Thursday night before I came here, we went out on date night. We have date night every Thursday night. That is a part of our routine. We've done that for 19 years. So... And, and, you know, God has just richly blessed us in that. This is my oldest son. That's Wesley. Uh, he uh, is married to this young lady right here. That's Becca and his wife. They've been married six years as of September 3rd. This is my middle son, Nicholas, and his wife, Emily. They've been married for two and a half years uh, as of July. And uh, he's in uh, South Carolina getting his Ph.D. in microbiology. He's the brains of the family. Uh, he says stuff, and I look at my wife and go, do you understand anything he's saying? She goes, no, I don't. <laughs> and this is our beautiful daughter, Victoria. She uh, lives about 30 minutes from us in a town called Christiansburg, and she is um, uh, works at a, a fitness studio. Uh, the fitness is her life. That's what she loves. And so we love our kids. So we want to talk about evangelism this morning, and I want you to see what we mean when we say evangelism. Here at the National Institute for Student Ministries, we've discovered a new method of evangelism that is shaking the very foundation of our thinking. It may appear unorthodox, but frankly, we're shocked at the results. We're amazed at this revolutionary idea, especially designed to boost student evangelism. Why do I want to be the evangelism linebacker? Well, let me put it to you like this. You see, as a fish was created to swim in water, as a bird was created to fly, I was created to knock people out who don't evangelize. The evangelism linebacker deals directly with a variety of students' fears associated with sharing their faith. 
All right, tell you whose house has got your name on it. I'm not ready yet. What makes you think I'm ready yet? Fear of rejection, for example. Let me talk to you about fear. Fourth and one, Jerry Rice, what you gonna do? They don't compare to fourth and one in eternity. It doesn't matter who rejects us because we're always accepted by Christ. God loves you. Get off the floor and go, go to go. <laughs> Can we talk to you for a minute? I'm a lover, not a fighter, baby. He loves you, but it might hurt. Sometimes I'll blow you up, but it's because I love you. Yeah, but just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I need to be out sharing my faith. I mean, God! Thanks to the evangelism linebacker, campus evangelism nationwide is up 87%. <laughs> Hey, I can't go to the outreach today. I got, I just got some more important things I gotta do. Uh huh. <laughs> hey man, give me a break. I went to church on Sunday. I gotta go. Selfishness. The world needs your message. For God to love the world, He wants to communicate it through you. If you procrastinate, you will open up the gate to a big guy. Give me that phone, boy. When I see selfishness. It is my job to blow them up. That's what I do. I blow them up so that they can get their eyes off the self and look at Christ, the prize. What's up, baby girl? Nah, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> We're intrigued as the linebacker is particularly effective in infiltrating centers of cultural and intellectual exchange. Here you go. Here's your double cappuccino latte mocha with a twist. Not too hot, not too cold. Perfect for you. Did you hear that talk from that guy the other day? Oh, I know. I thought we were supposed to be sharing a safe in my coffee shop. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Shut out of the coffee shop, baby! You It's unlikely that the recent decline in coffee sales has anything to do with our program. <laughs> You see, I think it's fitting because when people have pride, if they're too prideful to share their faith, what I do is I knock the pride out of them. <laughs> what I would like to communicate to my brothers and sisters is this. When you least expect it, around the corner, perhaps even under your bed, I can be in a phone line. I can be everywhere and just know that I'm always watching. Ready to lay the boom on you, baby. Booyah! Ouch. Are you ready for game day? Are you ready for game day? Are you ready to go out and share your faith? The thing is, is so many of us are just terrified to go out and share our faith with other people. But, but Jesus gives us this example of how to do it that's not quite so aggressive. And, and so we want to look at John chapter 4 and see how we can see our culture change if we'll merely engage in what Jesus modeled for you and I as we begin to walk through John chapter 4. So we're going to start in John chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 4 this morning. And we're going to read through uh, verse 42. He says, But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samarita, Samaria, which is called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came in to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, the Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, you who, have, who, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his son and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. 
but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of living water, springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, uh, I have no husband. Jesus said, You answered well. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one got to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming where you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You will worship, you worship what you do not know. We worship what, uh, for salvation of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. We'll pick up the rest of this in a little bit, but let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for the example that was set for us by your son, Jesus Christ, as he lived in humanity on this earth. He showed us what it looks like to reach out into the culture that surrounds us and bring to them the good news of Jesus Christ. God, may we be uh, moved through the Spirit by your word as we study this morning. God, give my lips, lips to only say the things that you need me to say. And God, may, may the folks that hear it be blessed and moved to action as we seek to build the kingdom of God on this earth. For your glory, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so one of the things we see that as we get started is that we need to always obey the Father. In verse 4, uh, it's written that he needed to go through Samaria. Now, if you understand the Jewish culture in the first century, the Jewish people hated the Samaritan people. Okay? It was not just a, oh, we dislike them. No, no, it was a deep level of hatred for those people because they were half priests. They had intermarried with the Assyrians when the Assyrians took over, and, and they just didn't like how they worshipped. And, and, and so the Jewish people, they wouldn't even set foot in Samaria. And when Jesus was going to go from, Galilee, from Jerusalem to Galilee, he would go down, the Jordan, down to the Jordan River in Jericho, down the Jericho Road. Then he would go up the Jordan River Valley into Jerusalem, take about six days. He could easily have gone through the mountains of Samaria and cut a few days off that. But they would always go that direction because they refused to step foot in Samaria. But Jesus needed to go to Samaria. How did he know that he needed to go to Samaria? Well, when we look at the life of Jesus, we see an example that he set for us, that he was extremely prayerfully dependent upon his Father, and was constantly led through the Holy Spirit to accomplish the will of the Father. I'll give you a for example. Jesus, at one point in time, went to uh, Capernaum. He went to the synagogue at Capernaum, threw out a uh, demon-possessed man, came down, hung out at Peter's house that night, healed his mother-in-law, healed a bunch of people in the town of Capernaum, went out to a pl private place to pray early in the morning. Right? When he was out there praying, the disciples came and said, hey, Jesus, come on. The crowds are back again. You're a rock star. We need to go. You're super popular. We're going to hang out with you. Right? When Jesus looked at them and said, Nah, we're not going that way. We're going into the other towns in the Galilee region. We're going we're gonna to go out into other places. This is where I must go. He spent time with the Father. And when he spent time with the Father, he would get leading and guiding from the Father through the Holy Spirit as he spent time with them. Well, let me ask you a question. Are we able to do that? Or was that just a Jesus thing? Because he was God. You know, Jesus lived his life on this earth fully human. He didn't pull out the God card and go, okay, I'm going to whip out my God card and take care of this issue right here. No, he lived as humanity was designed to be lived in the very creation of man. And so he lived in full dependence 
on his father, and he always acted through the guiding and leading of the Holy Spirit in his life. And so here we see that the Spirit of God is leading Jesus into a place that is extremely countercultural to the things that the Jews of that day believed. And so we need to always be willing to follow the leading and the guiding of the Spirit in our life, no matter how difficult it might be. And so many of us don't share our faith because it's going to be difficult. It, it might cost us something. We might look bad amongst our peers. People might think bad things about us. God doesn't call us to the easy things that we can do on ourselves. He calls us to the hard things that only He can do through us. That way, at the end of the day, I'm not glorified, but He is. And so we need to understand that, that we always need to, to obey the Father. And, and when we obey the Father, He puts us into positions where we can begin to cultivate relationships with other people. Jesus began to cultivate a relationship with this woman at the well. When they came into Samaria, they came into Sychar, he sat down by this well. This woman comes out at the sixth hour, excuse me, and Jesus spoke to her. Wow, that was unheard of. Two things. One, she was Samaria. And, and that's what she realized. She's like, wait a minute, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman. Jewish men did not talk to women other than their wives. It was culturally unacceptable. Jewish people didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. It was culturally unacceptable. But Jesus raised above the culture and began to do what the Father had called him to do, which was to engage this woman and begin to build a relationship with her. And so he begins by just speaking to her. How hard is it to speak to somebody who's lost? For a lot of us, it's extremely hard. When we talked yesterday about the fact that most Christians within five years of coming to know Christ as their Savior have completely isolated themselves with friendships that are only with believers. And so we don't have relationships with people that don't know Jesus. How are we going to fulfill the Great Commission and be obedient to what Jesus has commanded us to do? Am I allowed to say the word commanded? Is that okay? Is that acceptable? That's what God does is he commands us to do certain things. Jesus stood before his disciples and before giving the Great Commission says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore... Why do you think he started with that? He was establishing his right to make a command and expect them to obey it. So when we don't go and make disciples, what are we doing? Disobeying. Disobeying. We're, we're disobeying God and the direct command that he gave us as believers. As his children, he's given us a direct command. So Jesus is out here. He's building this relationship with this woman. He begins to talk to her and just gives her value because he merely spoke to her. And sometimes there's people in our culture that need somebody to come alongside them and begin to speak to them with kindness and acceptance regardless of where they are because he chose not to engage in the cultural issues. Jesus knew that it was wrong, that it was culturally unacceptable to speak to Samaritans. Jesus knew that it was culturally unacceptable to speak to women. But Jesus didn't care about obeying culture, even the culture of the religion of the day. Jesus cared about obeying the Father and what the Father was leading him to do. And so Jesus begins to have this conversation. He doesn't go into the conversation about their cultural differences, although she kind of veered the conversation in that direction. Jesus didn't take the bait. So he simply asks her for a drink of water. And then as they begin to go down, uh, she tells him that she's a Samaritan. And Jesus said to her, uh, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
And so Jesus begins to build something else in her. He, as he's cultivating this relationship with her, he avoids the obvious. Okay? He knew this woman wasn't of good reputation. Why? Because he was God? No. What time of day was it? It was noon. This woman was coming alone to the well at noon. What time did the women typically come to the well to get water for the day? In the morning, when it was cooler, and when they would have the water to do the things that they needed to do at home for the day. And they also may come later in the evening to do the evening cleaning and stuff like that. But they didn't come in the middle of the day because it was hot. This woman is avoiding the crowds because she's an outcast. She is somebody who they don't associate with. Can you think of people who are outcasts in your life? People that culture doesn't like? We're surrounded by them today. There's all kinds of different labels out there that we put on people. And we avoid them because they're culturally unacceptable. Well, Jesus didn't avoid this woman because she was culturally unacceptable. In fact, he knew that she had a sinful life, and he didn't even confront her sin. So often in our conversations with people, we, we, we want to confront their sin, and we want to fix their sin problem. And the reality is, is their sin problem isn't what needs to be fixed. It's their relationship with Jesus. Because once they come into that relationship with Jesus, he begins to fix their sin problem. A, he removes the penalty from their sin from them because they've confessed him. But B, then he begins to set them apart from that sin and begins to methodically move through their life and confront their sin and help them to move through that. Isn't that what he did for you? It's what he did for me. At 18 years old, I came to know Christ as my Savior. I had a very pagan lifestyle living in Southern California as a teenager up until that point in time. When I came to know Christ, my... Alan Darden, the guy that led me to Christ, didn't sit there and go, Tom, you got to stop smoking dope, you got to quit drinking, you got to quit sleeping around with your girlfriend, you got to quit doing these things. And then you need to come to Jesus. No, no. He told me about Jesus and how much God loved me. You know how God loved me? Exactly the way I was. You know how we're supposed to love the people that God puts around us? Exactly the way they are. We're not, it's not our job to change them. It's not about our job to change their gender identity. It's not our job to change their sexual preference. It's not our job to change their racial integrations. It's not our job to change anything about them. That's not ours. That's his. He gave us a job. Our job is to engage them and to tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the unconditional love of God that God has for them. As Jesus is engaging this Samaritan woman, She's an outcast. She had to be so freaked out by his looking at her and talking to her. It had to have scared her. But Jesus does not condemn her. And in John chapter 3, Jesus tells us this. He tells Nicodemus this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus kept their conversation on the things that mattered, even though a little bit later on we'll see that he, he addresses the fact that he understands her sin. He doesn't harp on her sin. He doesn't stay there and berate her because she's had five husbands and is now living with some other guy. <laughs> so understand when we begin to cultivate relationships with our friends, with people that God puts around us, we need to avoid the temptation to talk about their sin and simply keep it on the main thing. And the main thing is always Jesus. 
And so Jesus is developing this relationship with this woman. He's helping her to, to understand that she has value and that she's accepted by him because he's talking to her. He's having this conversation. And then he begins to, to plant a spiritual conversation with her. He begins to move the conversation away from the water at the well and begins to move it to something deeper, something deeper than the well. And in verse 13, he says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so he begins this spiritual conversation with her, planting into her mind that we're going to not just have a regular conversation, but we're going to begin to have a conversation that goes a little bit deeper. We're going to talk about eternal life and what that looks like and how do you get there. And so Jesus begins to have this conversation with her. And we see that she begins to respond with questions because she doesn't really understand what he's talking about. So he then goes, hey, you know what? Uh, worship. You know, you guys worship in Jerusalem. We worship in Samaria. We worship here on the mountain. Well, understand what she's talking about. She's talking about the fact that in their realm, she, in the Samaritan world, they have built altars on the high place where they go and worship God for their understanding of God. Now, a lot of these people are Jewish or Jewish-ish in culture because they're part of the nation of Israel. But when the kingdom is divided, in the southern kingdom, in the kingdom of Judah, that's where Jerusalem was, and that was where the temple was. Now, understand this. Back then, the Jewish people worshipped God in one place. The temple. That was where the presence of God resided, in the Holy of Holies, and that's where they went to worship God. That's why they would go down three times a year for the major festivals. And they would worship God there in the temple. They learned about God in the synagogues. Okay? They didn't worship God in the synagogues. We come to the church. There are churches all over the place. And in all churches and all kinds of places all over the country today, people are worshiping God. Right? But back then, there was one place to worship God. It was the temple. And so she's going, you guys worship in Jerusalem, but we've created this other place to worship because the kings back then didn't want the people from this area going down into Judea and to the temple and seeing how cool it is down there and leaving up here and living down there. So there was a reason why there were high places where they worshiped there and they didn't go to the temple to worship. So they created their own system of worship. And so Jesus wanted to help her to understand what things we're struggling with. That real worship is not found in a place, but real worship is in a person. And so Jesus begins to help her unpack this. And he says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He said, you will uh, worship the Father. You will worship what you do not know, for we know that we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Where do we worship now? Please don't say in the church. <laughs> we worship wherever we're at because the Spirit of God lives in us and so He's always with us. And no, there doesn't need to be two or three gathered together in His name for Jesus' presence to be there. Sorry, that's my whipping boy. I always beat that dead horse. But you don't need that. Just you alone out in nature. You can worship God wherever you're at. Isn't that a beautiful thing that we don't have to go to a place to worship? Okay, so I guess i got to explain something because people take that and they spin it into really unhealthy places. That doesn't mean we don't gather together at the church. Okay? Jesus said, I will build my church. 
Jesus is building his church, and he's built it both the, the, the universal church, the body of Christ, and he has broken it down into individual units called the local church, where the body of believers gathers together to corporately, together, worship him, to learn about him, and to utilize the gifts that God has given every single one of you. Did you know that you have a spiritual gift given to you specifically by God for use in this place? And when you don't show up into this place, it is missing a critical component that makes this church healthy. You are a vital part of what God is doing at Gospel Baptist Church in Galilee. Because he has gifted you to do something. What are you doing? Sorry, that was a sidebar. No, no extra money for that. Um, so, Jesus is, is helping this lady understand. Because she had a misunderstanding of what it really looked like to worship God. And so we need to help people to understand that real worship is a relationship, not a religion. And he helped to break down her misunderstandings in her life about what it meant to truly worship God and to enter into that eternal relationship with him. And so we begin to see her beginning to comprehend what he's saying. And Jesus um, helps her to understand that her worship is wrong. You know, we all worship something. I used to do a, a, a message on worship and I used to put up uh, pictures, uh, videos of football stadiums. And people in there go, yeah, woo! Screaming and yelling for their Pittsburgh Steelers. By the way, some really wonderful lady gave me these little things about the Pittsburgh Steelers because I'm sorry, I'm a Steelers fan. And, and I cheer and I yell and I scream at my TV when my Steelers are playing. And we go to rock concerts and we scream and yell and, and, and people faint in the aisles because there's this person on stage and they just worship them. We all worship something. Every person you're going to engage in your world worships something because it's innate in us that we are to express gratitude and worship towards something greater than us. That's why everybody worships something. They can't help it. What our job is, is as we begin to have these spiritual conversations with them, to help them see that the right one to worship is Jesus. And we need to help them understand that there is something where we can put our worship that's healthy. In Romans chapter 1, it says, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God uh, into the image it made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Everybody worships something. They either worship the moon, the stars, the sky, the animals, another human. So we have to understand when we're engaging people, we have to help change their thinking and answer their questions so that we can point them to the one that they're really supposed to worship. And that true worship is both spirit and truth. And we need to understand and help them to understand that God has created them uniquely and specifically to worship Him. Not delving into their sin, not talking about those side issues, but talking about the person of Jesus Christ and how He is the creator and the sustainer of the world and he offers them eternal life because He paid the penalty for their sin at the cross, died, buried, and rose three days later to defeat sin and death and offer us eternal life. That's what we need to help people to understand. So Jesus really was beginning to help this woman understand what worship truly was. And as a result, Jesus reaped a soul. And we see that this woman was really kind of wrestling with what was going on because early on she looks at Jesus and she goes, I, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. So, so there was beginning to be some understanding, and Jesus continued to unpack that for her. He didn't correct her. He didn't go, I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I'm the son of God. No. 
He just continued to talk to her about what was going on in her life and what she was struggling with and the whole concept of worship and who God truly was. And so she begins to sense this. And in verse 25, it says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he'll tell us all these things. Do you see the light bulb beginning to go off? She says, well, I think you're a prophet. But, but, but I know Messiah is coming. And he's going to tell us these things that you're telling me. She was inquisitive. She, she needed to know. He had sparked in her, by having those spiritual conversations, a curiosity. And for you and I, when we're dealing with the people in our world and we begin to have spiritual conversations with them, we're going to spark in them a curiosity about who God really is. It's going to manifest out of them in different ways. Some people are going to throw up all these roadblocks and these excuses of why God's not real and all these other things. And at that moment in time, we need to kind of handle those and help them unpack some of those. But we don't want to stay there. We want to bring it back to Jesus and talk to them about Jesus. Because as that spark rises up in them, there's going to be a crisis that happens in their life. Because how do most people live their life in this world? It's all about me. It is me-centric. I am right about everything. Everything I think is the right thing. And you just don't understand because you don't think like I think. And when we truly present Jesus to them and begin to have those spiritual conversations, and the Spirit of God begins to work in their life and begins to bring conviction into their life, in that moment they're going to have this wrestling match going on within them going, if I surrender to Jesus... My entire worldview has been wrong. And some people re react to that really harshly. And that's when we need to double down on our love and acceptance for them and tell them that it doesn't matter who you've been. God loves you and desires to have a relationship with you and need you to understand that there is one way to take care of all of that and to open the door into heaven. And that door is Jesus. And so understand that you're having these conversations with people and they're struggling. You need to then begin to help them unpack some of those conversations. But don't get hung up there. Because they're going to need to stay focused on Jesus and let the Spirit of God do His work. Remember, as we engage in this cultivating, planting, and reaping, this eternal CPR, we're not worried about the results because the results aren't up to us. That's God's job. One waters, one plants, it's God who brings forth the fruit. And so trust him. Trust the Spirit of God. And she, she believed. So he brings her to this point where she believes who Jesus is. And then she, she leaves and she runs back to town. While she's running back to town, the disciples come out of town. They're like, what's going on here? Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. And none of them really wanted to say anything to Jesus because they were afraid he was going to chastise them because they were being fools. And in which, if you read the Gospels and you read about the disciples, they weren't the sharpest tools in the box, right? They weren't the brightest bulbs in the chandelier. I mean, for, they were constantly fighting with each other about who would sit at his right hand when he came into his kingdom. They completely missed what Jesus was always talking about. Right up until the time they're, they're making the last trip into Jerusalem, and then some guys bring their mom into the equation. But the disciples come out. Let's look at verse 27. It says, at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled at the fact that he was talking with this woman. Yet no one said, what do you see? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come and see. If you were with us yesterday, you understand 
that the first part in the process of making disciples is to inviting people to come and see who Jesus truly is. That's the same thing that Jesus said to the disciples when they left John the Baptist. After John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, they begin to follow after Jesus, and they look at Jesus and say, Where are you staying? And he goes, Come and see. And he revealed himself to them, and they believed that he was the Messiah. And this woman goes to her town without ever going through our disciple-making training. Right? She goes to her town and she goes, come and see. This guy told me everything about me. I think he's the Messiah. And she begins to draw an entire town out. But his disciples are really struggling with this. And understand, okay, Stephen already talked about this. Jesus lived his life very intentionally and spent his time training and equipping disciples so that when he stood on that mountaintop outside of Galilee and after his ascent, uh, just before his ascension and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, because I'm going to be with you even to the end of the age. They didn't have to go, what's that look like? We don't know how to do that. He was always teaching and training them and equipping them because these were the gods, these were the people that were going to take the marvelous message of the cross and deliver it to the entire world. Wouldn't it have been a shame if Jesus would have come, died on the cross, and that would have been it? And nobody would have ever heard about it. No. Jesus spent three and a half years creating the movement that would take the message of the cross and deliver it to the entire known world in their day. And so this is a part of that training. As we look in John chapter 4, this is a part of what Jesus was doing to train these men. And says, uh, in verse 30, Then they went out of the city and came to him. That's the people coming out of the city. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Teacher, you need to eat. He said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. My life doesn't revolve around food. It revolves around doing the will of the Father who sent me. Do not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white for harvest. He who gathers, he who reaps, receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. The others have labored, you have not entered you have entered into their labor. So get the picture. Okay, Jesus says, look, the fields are white with harvest. Here comes these people out of Samaria to come check out who Jesus is. Now, I don't want to be culturally or racially insensitive, but I think it's pretty common that even back in those days, the men of those areas wore what on their heads? Turban. Little white towels wrapped around their heads. So here comes a whole herd of men out of that town. All these turbans on. And Jesus simply says, Look, the field is white with harvest. Here they come. It's already been done. You just need to look. Guess what? For you and I, you need to look. Pick your heads up. God's working in your world. I guarantee that. I don't guarantee a lot of things. But I guarantee you that God is working in your world. He is bringing conviction through His Holy Spirit. He is prompting people to pursue after Him. He is drawing all men unto Himself. He is working in your world. And we need to understand that the harvest field is ripe. The problem is that so many people are not sowing, not reaping, they're not planting, they're not cultivating. None of that. We're not doing it because we're comfortable. We're sitting in the church, we're getting fed, Things, the programs are good, life is good, we're comfortable. We don't want to disturb that comfort. But Jesus shows that the harvest is ripe. There just needs to be people who are willing to engage in the harvest process, to go out and cultivate relationships with people, begin to plant the Word of God into their life, and then begin to look for that opportunity to reap the harvest that God is going to bring. You can be the greatest evangelist in the world, but if God's not involved in what you're doing, you're not bringing people to Christ. 
And so in 39 it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come with him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. And they said to the woman, Now we believe, but not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So Jesus is you know, dealing with his disciples. I always forget to advance these things. Training his disciples, but an entire city is changed <laughs> because of the testimony of one culturally unacceptable woman who had an encounter with Jesus. You can radically change the world, the community, the town, the city, the state that you live in by simply being obedient to Jesus and doing what he's called us to do, which is cultivate relationships with lost people. Look for the opportunity to plant the word of God into their life and look for God's open door to clearly share the gospel and ask for a response and reap a harvest. You don't know what that one life will do. There's a guy named Alan Gardner. I talked to him. I showed a picture of him yesterday. Alan led me to Christ. Okay? Alan, you know, is a, is a love, guy who loves to fish. He has a beautiful family. Lives out in Southern California still. And he's just a regular Joe. Goes to church. You know, does, grows his family. Does life. But through Alan Darden leading me to Christ, God has used me to disciple hundreds of teenagers, adults, thousands of teenagers I've gotten the opportunity to speak to at SEMPs and remixes and reverbs and lead the causes around the country. We've had students come out of our ministry that, have, that are on the mission field, that are working in churches. I've got two guys that are pastors in Southern California. Pray for them. They're pastors in Southern California. So the harvest field is rich. Alan Darden didn't know what God would use my life for. And it's not anything about me. I haven't done anything special. I'm a, I'm, like I said, I'm not the bright bulb of the chandelier. That's Stephen. Like he said earlier, I was blessed to have him in my life for six years. But the reality is, is you don't know what God is going to do through you and the person that you talk to about Jesus. He can do amazing things through the obedience of a single life. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how smart you are. It doesn't matter. When God is in the mix, anything is possible. The problem is he will not force you to do it. He won't force you to go talk to your neighbor. He won't force you to build a relationship. This eternal CPR that we're talking about, the ultimate goal of that is that Jesus be glorified. Jesus was glorified in this situation with the Samaritan woman. He stepped outside of the cultural norms and he began this conversation. And as a result of that conversation, an entire town came to know Christ and was transformed by his presence. And so you and I have to begin to consider what are we going to do to cultivate relationships with people in our world? First, I'm going to challenge you. Look up. Look around. See what God is doing in your world. I guarantee you God is doing something in the lives of the people around you. They are struggling. They are hurting. They are messed up. And they're desperately in need of somebody to come alongside them and accept them where they are. And love them enough to show them the path out. Again, your job is not to fix them. That's God's job. And he does a marvelous job of that when given a chance. But your job is to see where God's working around you. To prayerfully consider, Father, what would you have me to do? Remember, Jesus knew he needed to go through Samaria. More than likely because he spent time with the Father. And the Father through the Spirit led him to go, no, no, you need to go that way. Don't go the normal way where everybody else goes. Go the opposite way. You might have to step outside of the norm and go in a different direction, and people are going to look at you like, why are you talking to that person? I don't know. I sense God led me to talk to that person. 
and they have all their cultural issues just glaring at you. But it doesn't mean God doesn't love them. He desperately loves them. Jesus died for them. He wants us to look up and look around and see the people that God is going to draw us to. Be willing to invest time with them. I think this is something that really keeps a lot of us from doing this, from engaging with people. Is it's going to take time out of our schedule. Now we're really busy. I mean, we've got all those shows on Netflix to watch. You know? And we're really busy. You know, we've got to tape all of the Hallmark Christmas movies and sit and binge watch them for days on end. I did not say anything about my wife. And we need to do all this stuff. We need to go hang out with our friends and, 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 and play golf and, and, and go to football games and, and do all these things. And we need to spend hours and hours and hours on our phone. Can we carve out a small chunk of time in our schedule and go, God, I'm going to give you this time and see what he does with it? Because it'll take time for us to invest in the people that God wants us to invest in. And then we need to begin to ask good questions of these people. We need to just engage them in conversation. And, and don't talk for the first time you meet them. Just to ask questions. Let them talk. Because you know what? The number one most important issue in everybody's life is? Themselves. Thank you. It's themselves. And if you open the door for them to talk about themselves, sometimes you won't be able to get them to shut up. <laughs> but what do you do when you open that door? And you honestly listen. And you engage. And you go, wait a minute. That's super curious to me. Can you explain that to me? And you engage them so that you're seeking to understand who they are. And you let them talk about themselves and you ask questions about them and you make sure you're understanding who they are. You have just valued this person in a way most people probably have never felt valued in their life. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It's simply going, you know what? God loves you and so do I. Let's talk. And I want to find out about who you are. And once you find out how about who they are, and you can ask where they're from. We teach this to our teenagers. Ask them about their family. Ask them about their recreational habits. Ask them about their occupation well, for teenagers, school. Ask them about their memories. What do you remember most from your life? What's the number one memory that comes up in your head? That'll tell you a lot about a person. But ask them where they're from. Ask them who they are. And talk and listen. You will cultivate a relationship with that person where they will then start to come to you and share their problems with you. Because you simply showed that you cared. Our world is starving for people that will authentically care about them. Because the culture is a wreck. And all people are trying to do is force their opinions on other people. When we're sharing Jesus, that is not our goal. When we cultivate a relationship with somebody, we're not cultivating a relationship with them just to share Jesus with them. We're cultivating a relationship because they've been made in the image of God and they're valuable. And we get to be their friends. And maybe we're going to be their friends for a long time before they ever come to know Jesus, if they ever come to know Jesus. And if they don't, we'll still be their friends. That's important. Because that will open doors down the road if you don't reject them because they're rejecting Jesus. So begin to have those cultivating relationships. Begin to plant the word of God into their life. When you start talking to somebody, the spirit of God is at work, both in you and in them. And so we trust that God's at work. And so what happens is God's going to open up this door. There's going to be this thing that they say or a question that they ask that's going to open up the door for you to begin to have a Jesus conversation. One of the first things that may happen is they may ask you about your life. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have written down your testimony and can share your testimony with somebody in under three minutes? Okay. Highly recommend that you do that. 
because you, we think we can share our testimony with people and then we get the opportunity and it comes out this jumbled mess <laughs> because we haven't really thought it through. But you know what? Jesus has done an amazing, if you know him, he's done an amazing thing in your life. He set you free from the penalty of your sin. He's offered you a relationship with the Father and that relationship begins now and it lasts forever. He's given you hope of eternity. That should be something exciting to share. You should be able to share your story with the people that are around you. Let me tell you this. Whoops, I... Parents, share your testimony with your children. Amen. I cannot tell you how many funerals I've had to do where I've talked to the family and they go, oh, he's a Christian. Great. Can you tell me how you know that? Tell me their story so I can tell everybody at the funeral their story. And the family looks at me and goes, we don't know, we've never heard it. Your children need to hear your testimony. Your grandchildren need to hear your testimony. So that they know that you're following Jesus and that they want to follow after your footsteps. So share your testimony with people. Look for opportunities to invest in them. Give them opportunities to check Jesus out. Come and see, you know. Let's, let's look at this. And they might have a question about creation. They might have a question about uh, God and whether or not the Trinity is true. They might have some weird question. Don't answer their question. Invite them to come with you and check it out. Open up the Word of God with them and begin to look into the Word of God and go, see, it says here. This is why we believe this here. Because your words, uh, I don't mean to offend you, your words are not powerful. His are. Amen. His is, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. So use his words. Bring them in. Open the scriptures with them and go, see, this is why I believe what I believe, because this is true. Well, I don't believe the Bible's true. Really? Why not? How do we explore that? Do you want to explore that with me? Great, let's go look at this. And take them into an exploration of why we believe the Bible is true. Those are great conversations to have with people. But invite them in to check him out. And then we need to work on dismantling spiritual roadblocks in their life. They're going to have it. They're going to have all the excuses in the world as to why they can't come to Jesus. Okay? It's at this point, as we're having these deep conversations, that we need to take some time and dismantle those spiritual roadblocks. Okay? It's, going to be, it's going to come out as excuses, but we need to caring and lovingly and directly dismantle those roadblocks. They need certain answers to certain questions. Be careful, because sometimes they're just going to throw roadblocks at you to keep you off track. Remember to always bring it back to Jesus. Always bring it back to Jesus. And then when we're looking to reap, you need to tell them the gospel. You need to clearly Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ in clear and concise ways so that we can reveal to them who Jesus truly is. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the promised one of God who takes away the sins of the world and offers us an eternal relationship with the Father. And clearly present the gospel and give them an opportunity to respond. So often we share the gospel with somebody and we just leave it. Finish it. Look at them and go, so does what we talked about make sense to you? Well, yes. Okay, so if it makes sense to you, is there anything that's keeping you from putting your faith in Jesus today? Give them an opportunity to respond. If they say no, say what's keeping you from putting your faith in Jesus? They'll bring up another roadblock. Deal with it. The end of dealing with that one, and again, that might take days or weeks to deal with that. But at the end of dealing with it, share the gospel very clearly. Everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ should know how to share the gospel with somebody else. There's all kinds of methods out there, but you should be able to clearly articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ because isn't that the pathway by which you became saved? And if you cannot clearly, articulately share the gospel, do you know it well enough to have salvation? That's a question we all have to answer in our lives. 
If I can't verbalize what the gospel is, do I know it well enough to be saved? I'm sorry if that's offensive, but it's a harsh reality. And God loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you that begins now and lasts forever. And just because you walk in the doors of this church does not mean you have a relationship with Jesus. It means that you're religious and you go to church. Good for you. But that's not what gets us to heaven. So, in wrapping up, Jesus gave us an example of what it looks like to lead somebody to salvation through him. We cultivate that relationship. We look for opportunities that God's going to give us to plant the Word of God into their life. And then we look for the opportunity God's going to give us to clearly present the gospel, ask them for a response, and reap a harvest. You may be a planter. You may be a sower. You may be a waterer. You may be a, a reaper. You may reap a lot of things that you didn't really have the conversation to cultivate the relationship with this person. But you're going to reap the rewards because you're going to clearly share the gospel and they're going to get saved. But are you doing your part? Are you involved in the process? Are you doing what we've been commanded to do? Be my disciples, be my, make disciples, be my witnesses, spread the gospel. Those were the commands that Jesus gave between his resurrection and his ascension. Five times he told his disciples to, go, to be his witnesses, that I'm sending you as the Father sent me, that you need to go and make disciples, that you need to be my witnesses in all Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and the rest of the world. He gave them multiple challenges to go do what we're talking about. Those challenges are ours too. If we're not doing them, we're not being obedient. It's just as simple as that. So today, as, as we think about this in our own lives, I'm going to ask you to respond in one of two ways. Number one, do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you have a relationship with Jesus that's going to last for eternity? If you're uncertain about that, I would love to talk to you after this is over. Stephen would love to talk to you after this is over. Other people in this room would love to talk to you after this is over. Because that is the most important question you need to be able to answer. I am convinced that I have a personal relationship with Jesus because I see the fruit of the Spirit in my life as God continually transforms me into the image of His Son. And if you are truly a child of God, are you being obedient to what God has commanded you to do in sharing His Word, telling others about Him, seeking to bring other people into the kingdom and grow them up in Him? If not, Will you commit today to start? And who would be the person that you're going to go to first and start talking about Jesus? So last week we looked at Acts 2 and Acts 17. And maybe you've already started thinking about how this connects back to that because I think for a lot of years as Christians we, were, we, we got trained on the reading. Right? And we lived in a culture that did the, the first two parts. We had homes that did the first two parts. We had neighborhood churches that did the first two parts. And so you could meet a stranger and start talking to them about how they trusted Jesus as Savior. We don't live in that culture anymore. We've got to realize we're going to have to actively go out and start with our neighbors and our student, the students we're at school with and our coworkers. We've got to start all the way back at Cultivate. And we may have to spend a year or two getting to know them and having conversations with them to be able to build and work up to the place to talk to them about Jesus. Not because we're nervous, but because they just can't understand that conversation without a whole bunch of work getting to that point. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's not going to bring you to people that at some point it's the first time you've ever talked to them and they're ready to hear about Jesus. That may happen. But as I pray in just a second, I want to ask you if you would uh, make those things that Tom challenged us about at the end, make those things kind of official between you and God. Make, make that commitment, make that surrender, and probably 
you're going to go one of two directions as you think about making a commitment to God with this being engaged in the CPR process. It's probably one of two things. One, God's already put somebody on your mind, and, and all throughout the sermon, you've been thinking about how burdened you are to get to that person and try to try to see if they'll listen about Jesus. You, you already know who the person is. They're weighing heavy on your heart. Or you realize, I don't have anybody that's in this process. I don't have any relationships where I think they need to hear about Jesus or or we've got any kind of investment where they're going to listen to me about Jesus. So whichever one of those it is, or maybe something else, would you just talk to God about it as we close and, and say, God, help me to, to keep this burden so that as I see that person this week or so that as I make an appointment to get together with them, I'll continue to have the passion that I have, the burden that I have right now in that moment. I'll overcome my fear and I'll share the gospel with them. Or, God, show me who I need to invest in. Give me somebody this week that just jumps out. I can't miss it. And that's the person I know I need to start. Now, you might have 10 people you're in this process with. And you don't know which one's getting saved. Which one's getting saved next? Which one's going to get discipled first? You don't know. That's okay. Cultivate all of them. Look at all of them and see, okay, where can we go next? What are they ready for next? And that's where we come back to that Holy Spirit dependence. You don't have to figure it out. Just stay in tune with God and follow His leading. Would you pray about those as we close our time from the sermon? Father, we thank you for... This clear example from Jesus. Many of us probably already familiar with this story. But even if we've heard it for the first time, it's very very plain what happened in that moment. It's very obvious what Jesus did and the results from it. God, help us to be like Jesus who is constantly in tune with you, ready to see where are you pointing us next, where are we going next, to not allow fear to hold us back. And Father, unfortunately, not to be like the big group of the people that claim to be Jesus' followers. There was Jesus, and then there was a whole group that said they were following him. But they went into town and came back out empty-handed. The one who was really following Jesus went into town and brought the whole city back out. God, help us to make sure we don't settle into a comfortable I've got a label of a disciple. I've got a label of a church member. I've got a label of a Christian. And yet we go into the city and we come out empty-handed, never lifting up our eyes, never paying attention to the harvest, never cultivating or planting or seeking to reap. Help us to genuinely follow the example of Jesus. God, help those who have a burden for somebody. Help them to, to, to just sense right now how clearly that is the person that you want them to go and invest in. And Father, that they would hold on to that burden and that passion, that fear would not overwhelm them, that hesitation would not overwhelm them, that you would not allow the enemy to get in and, and set them aside. And Father, if, if there is a failure of being bold, that Father, they would recover from that and the next time go in and be bold. And help us. We need to go out and really change almost and maybe even a whole approach to our daily life where, where, where we've gotten so comfortable with being Christians that we've forgotten that we need to go out and actively seek relationships with the law so that we can cultivate, care for them, show them your love, and be a part of what you're doing in their lives. God, help us to, to step out of that comfortable and complacent place to be your servants, to be your ambassadors to a world that is desperate and in need of you. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for loving us enough to send somebody who was bold, maybe was very nervous in the moment, but shared the truth with us of the gospel that we would be saved. And God, help us to be obedient to you, to be your ambassadors, your mouthpiece, your messengers to this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to challenge you this morning if you are uh, interested in discipleship. Maybe you've, you've heard some of the things we've talked about today and you said, you know, all that sounds really interesting, but truthfully, I don't really have a clue about most of what you're saying. Uh, we have a process called discipleship where if you want to grow in following after Jesus, we have uh, personal coaches. Uh, we have personal one-on-one -on -one people we want to pair you up with 
but they're going to meet with you on a regular basis. They're going to help you learn the Word of God, understand what is it saying, how do I live that out, how do I become an active and faithful Christ follower. If you're interested in that, uh, all you need to do is let us know. Uh, we have material that you'll walk through. Uh, we have a very organized way of, of processing that. Now, every relationship is different, uh, but we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to plug into that if you're interested. If you're a couple and you want to go through it as a couple, that's great. If you're an individual and you want to go through it by yourself, that's awesome. Uh, we have a new resource here we shared with the disciplers on uh, Saturday, I believe, maybe Friday night. Uh, if you're struggling to get started in your devotional life, spending time as a Christian in the Word of God with Jesus on a regular basis, uh, we've got a thing called a starter pack. Uh, this is not a lifelong thing for you to use. This is exactly what it says. It's a starter pack. It's just a little booklet, but it's got a simple way of getting started reading the Bible for yourself on a daily basis and growing in Christ. Uh, it's got that in there as well as a little helper on starting to take notes in Bible study time, whether it's worship service or whatever, uh, so that you can get the most out of that. Disciplers, uh, go ahead and start talking about and We've got those published and those are ready to use, so if you want to use those in discipleship. If you're interested in that but you're not in discipleship, come see us. We'll charge you a small fee, but we'll still let you have one. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to charge anything. Uh, that, that's free. If, if it'll be a help to you, we'd love to have that. But I can tell you, you'll get the most out of it when you're going to meet with somebody on a regular basis and follow up to what you're doing there, share your struggles, share what you're learning, and let them share what's going on in their life as they're doing the same thing. All right, it seems like I had another announcement that I forgot about, so I'm going to go look at my cheat sheet here. Uh, discipleship process. Okay, as we come in next week, uh, Donald, if you want to go ahead and come on up. Uh, next week, we'll be back up front in the main auditorium, and as we do that, we're going into our hospitality series, and so there's some things the praise team is going to be doing a little differently over the next couple of weeks, a couple of things we're going to do a little differently in service, uh, so as you come into the auditorium, don't be surprised if something's a little different as you come in. Next week, and then in, even in weeks after that, things look a little different, we do things a little different process. You know, don't wig out. It's okay. Uh, we'll walk with you through it. We'll, we'll tell you what we're doing. Uh, we're not going to be throwing pies at anybody or anything like that. Not, not that kind of stuff. Not that craziness. Uh, but, but we've got some intentional things we want to do to foster some, some increased spiritual growth during this series. Donald's going to give us the announcements, and then he's going to dismiss us. Thank you for being with us. I was actually excited for the throwing pies part. But just make a pumpkin. Just make a pumpkin. <laughs> All right, so we can see the layout is a little different here. The giving boxes are going to be by the exit doors. Um, so if you have your time or whatever, it goes there. Not up front today. Uh, just a reminder, our evening services are all starting tonight. So your Lord Act meeting, that's going to be tonight, 6 o'clock p.m. for most of them, I believe. Uh, then we have a list of donations we need for the Sparrow College. There's a list. At the Welcome Center, it's about 10, 12 items. They're pretty small things like candy, gum, toothpaste, real little items. There's going to be a red bucket by the Welcome Center. You can put those in there. And all of that is needed no later than October 2nd. So if you come October 3rd, you're late. Just make the 2nd or sooner. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.